broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, good morning, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Mohamed Hagezi, and I will be your, panel, your moderator today. And this is a webinar hosted by the UITP and the SSATP uh, African Transport Policy Program by the World Bank. And it is the second uh, webinar in a series of three webinars on informal transportation. Today, we will be talking about the key factors of success that we need to formalize informal transportation. And we'll be focusing particularly on the governance side of things and the significance of public transport authorities in this transformation. Now, allow me first to present you quickly with the agenda for today's webinar. Following that, we will ask the chairperson of the informal transport group at UITP to give us some opening words and followed by uh, the uh, representative of the SSATP. So today in the webinar, um, first of all, we will be breaking it into two parts and a total of five panelists, each doing a 10 minute presentation. The first part will contain three presentations about case studies and lessons learned from different cities around the world. We will start by Mr. Hindulo Shiaka, the director of the Ministry of Transport and Aviation in Freetown, who will talk to us about the experience of Sierra Leone, followed by Mr. Angel, who will give us the brief experience of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And finally, Mr. Bergerho, Mr. Joachim Bergerhof, who will talk about the Southeast Asian experience. In the second part, we will be talking about uh, concrete policy recommendations that we take out of them. And here we will start by Mr. Benjamin de la Peña from Make Swift Mobility and Mr. Eran Onku, who will talk to us about the Turkish experience. Uh, on this note, I need to take two steps back and actually give the floor to the chairperson of the UITP, uh, Informal Transportation Working Group, Mr. Feizola, to present today's presentation. Mr. Feizola, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Mohamed. Uh, the topic here today we are going to uh, discuss and uh, discuss it together is very important for us. Uh, as you said, I don't want to take too much time because I want to uh, give more time to our distinguished and uh, very important speakers. But uh, let me state once, once more Informal transport sectors plays very big role in our cities. Uh, most of the public transport service given by informal sector. In the era of COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we have seen that informal public transport sector uh, is not sustainable in terms of financing. Sectors are facing bankrupt problems. In Turkey, the uh, individual operators saying always like that we are bankrupting. That's why I am using uh, that word. Their income uh, dropped down very dramatically. And this is the main problems of the sectors in the period of pandemic, in this period. But there are some other problems in the informal sector that we have to find solution. Uh, maybe in this seminar, we are going to discuss and uh, share the solution around the world. Uh, for example, safety, during the COVID period and uh, the normal period, uh, also security of, of the vehicles, operational efficiency is another problem of the informal sector. Service quality is another problem. Contract modeling, punctuality, and state of technology, maybe. Uh, there is no regulation, and uh, there, these are the vulnerability within uh, the public uh, informal sector. In other words, these are the weak side of the informal sector. Besides this, there are some advantages of the informal sectors. And uh, this sector does not need any subventions uh, or support till period of pandemic. In the last uh, normal period, prep uh, pandemic, there was uh, no discussion about supporting uh, or subvention of the informal sector. 
but it needs now because the uh, number of passenger dropped down that's why the revenue also dropped but the advantages of the informal sector it is flexible and more dynamic and uh, sometimes it is maybe uh, in general it is cheap than the uh, formal one uh, as you said, as you see, there are uh, good things and bad things for the informal sector. And sometimes we know that the crisis trigger revolutions and trigger the change. I want to consider COVID-19 as a trigger of changing from informal to formal one. Today we are going to seek an answer for this question that formalization can be a good solution for these problems. Uh, thanks to the UITP team, Emmanuel and Arthur, and also thanks to the World Bank and SSATP for supporting this event. Uh, I would like to thank all our speakers and uh, hope all the listeners will have a very good uh, knowledge, experience, and uh, have a fruitful uh, seminar. Thank you very much for attending and listening uh, this uh, UITP seminar. Yeah, okay, this is the, my introduction uh, moment. Mr. Faisola, thank you very much for giving us a brief overview of the informal transport sector and the various good and things and bad things that surround it. As you mentioned, a crisis can trigger change and we are definitely in a moment of crisis. And the informal transport sector does transport more than 2 billion people around the world. And in fact, the majority of citizens in Africa rely on it day by day. And this is why I'm really honored to give the word next to Mr. Mustafa bin Muammar, who is the lead transport economist at the World Bank and the acting program manager of the SSATP program, who joined forces with the UITP in bringing this webinar to reality today. Uh, Mr. Mustafa, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, uh, everybody. I'll be uh, very short. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, UITP for uh, uh, this fruitful uh, collaboration with uh, the World Bank SSATP uh, to discuss this important uh, topic. It is certainly uh, one of the priority areas at the, the World Bank and SSATP. Um, it's a central part of our development uh, plan for the next five years. Uh, this is a very challenging uh, topic. Um, we, we have uh, tried to identify all the issues, I think, uh, over the last uh, decade. Uh, and we'd like now to uh, go uh, to one step further and, and see if we can find uh, a good case studies um and recommendations to uh, to uh, start the reforms um i think this webinar is is uh, setting uh, the scene uh, we are not going to resolve the 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 issues surrounding the informal sector in one session uh, but uh, the, this is something that will be recurrent uh, at least at the ssatp program uh, we are about to initiate additional studies uh, to understand better the situation and uh, most of all to see how uh, and learn from uh, good case studies the advantage uh, by teaming up with uh, with the world bank and uh, uitp is is to have this uh, a global reach and learn from uh, uh, lessons from many many uh, countries so uh, without further ado uh, uh, I would like to, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to the presentations uh, and, and the discussions. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mustafa. And uh, indeed, I'm really glad that you mentioned the objective of today's mm -hmm. webinar. It really is about knowledge generation and knowledge sharing. It's really about many different people from around the world coming together to learn from each other. And in that spirit, we will be launching a quick poll right now to our attendees asking you where do you come from please feel free to uh, answer the poll at your uh, comfort and we will announce the results later on during the presentation mm -hmm. uh, on that note i will leave the floor to mr emmanuel 
uh, from the UITP to give us a brief overview of the series of webinars that are taking place. Mr. Emmanuel, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Happy to have uh, everyone on board. Uh, happy to have this uh, uh, high-level uh, panel of speakers. Uh, thank you to Mr. Hesula, to Mr. Mustafa from uh, UITP uh, Informal Transport and World Bank SSATP. Welcome to everyone. Today, uh, we have uh, targeted a large audience. Um, given the, the timeline, particularly uh, <clears throat> Africa, some part of Asia, and also Latin America, and we're really happy to to widen our perspective and, and uh, say uh, crossing different uh, experience and views. That was that was one 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 word to start to start with. As you mentioned, uh, Mohamed, the question is really about uh, generating knowledge, and this is why we have uh, at UITP uh, proposed, and we're really happy to have World Bank SSATP with us. Uh, to organize those three webinars. The first, very first webinar that took place on the 31st of August uh, was about uh, the uh, impact of COVID on this situation. It was more about to describe the situation, the impact of the crisis, put some words, uh, put some, some data, some figures, and, and start uh, also uh, identifying some, let's say, short-term firefighting type of actions that could be implemented. Now in the second webinar, we're going to step back a little bit and uh, we're really tackling the question of uh, governance, the question of uh, uh, legal context, the question of institution. This is really the, the main goal of this, of this webinar. Um, as we consider that uh, there's need for institutional reform um, in order to, let's say, shift from an informal transport system to a more formal transport system. And that's the conditions of this transformation is something we're really going to discuss and talk about today. Um, and then the last webinar that's going to take place, I'm doing a bit of teasing on the 26th of October, uh, is, uh, is more about technological solutions uh, that exist, uh, that are being developed, that are being used today by informal transport operators, uh, let's say to optimize their operational conditions, but also that can be used uh, in order to contribute to the formalization of the informal transport. That's 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 the goal of the of the three webinars, and that's it for me. Thank you again, and really happy to listen to the next uh, speakers. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. So to give a quick overview over today's presentation, uh, yes, fantastic. Um, we are currently in the midst of a global pandemic, and it is really affecting our life and as mr fezola said a crisis can be a trigger for change and change is really needed in the informal transport sector when we look at the state of poverty in the world today and how it is increasing due to covid 19 the state of inequality but also global challenges such as climate change and the need for deep decarbonization across the world now today we're going to try to understand what are the key factors of success to formalize the informal transport sector and we will focus on the transformative role that authorities play in this transformation process we have allocated approximately 100 minutes to answer five questions and we uh, we shared these questions with all of our speakers before and really worked hard behind the scenes to adapt today's presentations to answer them what are the gains that we can get from the formalization of the sector? We want to learn about the successes and the failures that we encountered across the different case studies. We want to think of the frameworks, theoretical and practical, that were used and discussed and that are part of the global narrative to facilitate this change process. BRT is a constant theme that comes up when we talk about informal transportation. And a lot of projects tackling informal transportation, particularly in my continent, Africa, are directly related to the introduction of a formal BRT uh, piece of infrastructure. And finally, we are seeing some massive change, new business models, new technologies and mobility service providers enter. And the question becomes, how do we involve them? And to this, we, the UITP assembled today's five speaker, uh, Arthur, if you can move to the next slide, please. And we have today's five speakers who will really give us a global overview of the problem. The first part of the presentation, we will hear three case studies. 
from Africa, from Latin America, and from Southeast Asia. And on this point, I think it's a good opportunity to take a moment back and to look at the results of the poll. So today we are currently at over 60 attendees in this webinar. More approximately half of us are coming from Africa. I feel proud today. And quickly followed by Europe and the Americas. And finally, we have 10% of the attendees from Asia. And this really, I think, is very representative of the global distribution of the informal transportation sector. It really is largest in Africa and followed by cases in the Americas and in the Asian continent. So the first three case studies will be from Africa, from Latin America, and from Southeast Asia. And we really learn from the different cities, uh, followed by the second part, where we will try to get first a global overview of the problem of informal transportation and the changes that are taking place. And the final fifth presentation will be about the Turkish experience from the UITP's very own Mr. Erhan, uh, who has, brings the theoretical framework of the experience of Turkey in formalizing this sector. Without further ado, let's start with the first presentation. Today, our speaker, our first speaker will be Mr. Hindulo Shiaka. Mr. Hindulo is the director at the Ministry of Transport and Aviation in Freetown in Sierra Leone. He is currently working as the coordinator of the Sierra Leone Integrated and Resilient Urban Mobility Project, IRUMP. His presentation today is titled The Situation of Freetown. And it really talks about the experience of the regulator, the Sierra Leone Road Transport Corporation, and the experience of it to transition to become a regulator. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Hendula, Hendulo, I apologize, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Igezi, and for the introduction. I hope everyone is hearing me. And um, I will share my screen, and I hope everyone is seeing my screen. OK. Um, as mentioned, yes, I will be, yes. I will be presenting the situation of Freetown, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the uh, SSATP and UITP for finding Freetown as a case study to invite us on this platform. And I also will want to thank the bank, uh, the World Bank and my team for putting this presentation together. I obviously, as every other speaker has mentioned, um, it is a very complex topic we are dealing with, uh, with varying implications in different geographic zones, but also common denominators can be found. And also that it's not easy for one answer fits all. And that's why I'll be happy to be participate in the discussions that will follow. However, I will um, be very quick with my presentation to bring out some of the situations in Freetown. And hopefully, uh, those situations will answer the, some of the questions Mr. Hegazi was talking about. So um, I have done the presentation to, to look at two key questions. What are the key conditions of success to formalize the sector? And what role can authorities play in favor of this transformation process? Um, we, I have presented it in a way that every, each slide will try to answer these two questions concurrently because of time and the limited number of slides we are expected to present. So um, I will first of all give a context of the city I am presenting from, which is Freetown, and to which this um, presentation is based. As you can see, a population of about 1.1 million people, a very small city. And um, we are hemmed in between the Atlantic Ocean and, and to the west, and of course, a mountain to the east. It's a very beautiful city with very good beaches, but very narrow roads, and we'll welcome you to visit Freetown. But in short, this is uh, what we look like in terms of numbers 
uh, the re urban growth rate by 2025 will be somewhere about 43 percent of the urban population that is the city of freetown and this presentation is based to reflect the conditions in freetown now um, another status quo that we need to look at before we go into the conditions of uh, success is the institutional arrangements we have currently um, how it looks like now within the road transport sector within freetown we have the ministry of transport and aviation mta um, also supervising two parastate institutions the sierra leone road transport corporation in Mr. Hegazi's opening, he mentioned that this organization will be transitioning from an operator to a full regulator. And we have another institution, the Sierra Leone Road Safety Authority. They are into road safety, but also are responsible for licensing of vehicles and, um, and drivers. In this same space of the road, we have the Ministry of uh, um, Public Works, and uh, the Ministry of Works and Public Assets, so they actually physically build the roads, whilst we legislate it and manage it. Um, they also, under this context of the road, have the, the Road Management Fund Association, um, and then we have the Sierra Leone Roads Authority. And then within the same space as we have currently, we have the East, East, uh, Indigenous Transport Owners Association. This is mainly the private sector. The drivers union the the um, three wheelers and two wheelers associations the market women and funnily you will be wonder why, why market women the context we are explaining as well is where you have a lot of hawking taking place in the road space where you have the pedestrian walkway is full by people selling stuff on the road and pushing pedestrians to walk on the street so they are in the context of the reform this is extremely important and in this same space we have the traffic police division and all of this mix we have the freetown city council the local government municipality so you will see the, the nature i'm driving to drive at is on my left here we have overlapping mandates because of the disjointed nature that things are showing now we have isolated mandates and mandates that have been ignored we have conflicting functions between national and local governments and lack of coordination between government entities and very low planning. This is the context we are. And that has impacted on urban sprawl, weak coordination, and lack of accountability and clarity of functions. Now, another context that I will go into before we continue the presentation is resource constraint. It's a, it's a very key context to note within and in the informal transport reform. And in fact, what energizes the informal transport reform uh, uh, informal transport growth can be linked one of the key uh, factors is resource constraint now in the global urban transport reform we will find the informal transport reform as a subset of it but the key issues i want to draw your attention to is one is the human capital one of the key issues that we are facing in in, in order to help have a success is to address the lack of human resource capacity within the sector. The other issue that is clearly an issue to address as we try to formalize and gain success in the informal transport sector reform is infrastructure itself. The road networks that we have, how are they? What, how are they available? The conditions of these roads and other forms of infrastructure, bus stops, and I'll talk about that when we get further. And a key issue throughout is finances. I mean, um, the, the investments from the private sector, but also the investment from the public sector. So with these constraints, I will move on to talking about what's the vision for Freetown? What are we looking at? We are looking at transition in Freetown from a congested people-oriented city to a resilient people-oriented city. In short, I always say, from presentations and engaging within the city that we want to move more people than vehicles and that is why we are looking at that's the vision of the ministry of transport and of the wider transport sector and to achieve this we have set up a project called the uh, integrated and resilient urban mobility project and this project is going to address um, the transformation in these formats, the uh, um, organization of routes, 
doing some infrastructure and introducing quality rolling stocks into the system, the vehicles. And all of this will come with two forms of reform. The institutional reform, as we mentioned earlier, we're transitioning some institutions to be regulators. And of course, the operational reform of how the informal sector will be organized to be able to operate within this sector that we want to formalize. Now, um, institutional reform, as I earlier on, I have earlier on showed you what we are now. Going forward, and this is a note for some of the conditions for success, is that we are transitioning the Sierra Leone Road Transport Corporation, that is a government-owned parastate organization that runs the buses currently um, alongside other private operators. Now, we, as part of the reform, the Sierra Leone Road Transport Corporation will evolve from an operator to a regulator because this space is currently lacking and that is affecting how the, the urban transport space is organized and that as well trickle down to the informal sector organization because there is no clear court regulatory body to, to, to look into all of this. So the SLRTC will be transitioned into such. The SLRTC also will divest existing assets um, and city operations. They are currently operating both in the city and intercity buses. Uh, one of the first step we we'll do is to divest the city operations to private sector owners that we are organizing. And at this point, I will say in the way we're doing it is to ensure that the current private owners, because this has, by our experience, is reducing significantly the, 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 the friction in, in getting this transitioning. The current transport owners are being organized currently into cooperatives and companies so that they have the first right to operate in the routes where they are operating now. That is going on currently, and we are engaging very um, detailed manner in how this should work out. Then the SLRTC capacity building as well is, is part of the reform because they are moving from operations to regulator, that structures to change and capacity required will be um, um, needed. So that is going on. And they will be contracting and tendering um, contracts. They will be managing these contracts for the private sector. They will be monitoring and evaluating the way the sector operates and will define um, requirements going forward. So that is with regards to the institutional reform. And um, we are also, one very novel thing we are doing in Freetown is the stakeholder and citizens engagement. In fact, as part of the very project that um, we are partnering with the World Bank, uh, the Integrated Resilient Urban Mobility Project, we set up a steering committee. And in this steering committee, we brought both the formal institutions like the Ministry of Transport, the Freetown City Council, the SLRS, the Sierra Leone Road Safety Authority, the police. But key, key, key to this, and in Freetown, this is the first time it's happening, we brought the informal sector to sit at the, at the highest decision-making level body, the steering committee. And those are the transport unions, the traders union, the passenger welfare associations, the three-wheeler associations, the two-wheeler associations, and we even brought in the market women and, and uh, associations to sit at their, their heads to sit as part of the steering committee so that when we make the decisions, the implementation, will, the, the, the decision will be all of us, not just a formal sector sitting with a tie in our air condition office, make these decisions and push it down the throats of the informal sector. We brought, we brought them around the table, and this is a significant um, key success condition for us in Freetown. And also, uh, the operational reform will also take the form of owners to form new contracted routes and associations. And as we go further, you will see the, 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 the pilot routes per corridor we are using to, 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 to introduce all of these reforms. But also we will establish contractual agreements between route associations and the regulator, which will be SLRTC as, regu as transformed to deliver services under certain standards. So that currently the, um, the informal sector Everybody just buy what they buy, the assets they buy, they start to do their business, no form of regulation, no control, no, no standards are set. This is what the relationship would be like going forward. That's why we formalize them into a company so that they can be, they can have obligations, but there is also they can share liabilities. And of course, um, the operational reform will also look into negotiating the framework of how these operations will go on. Then the routes, as I mentioned, in Freetown, we have we have a lot of routes, but the two key routes are those in blue and red. The red is towards the east of the city and to the center business district and from the center business towards the dead west. 
this is a pilot route we are using and each of these corridors will have three routes and um, that we will license for operators that will operate uh, new buses and the infrastructure so currently as i'm telling you a contract has been awarded for the civil works to improve the pavements to do the bus stops to do the uh, drainages for the resilience when it rains so that the buses will continue to work, move to, to pave where we need to pave. So there is a lot of work going on in terms of civil works in this corridor. Uh, this corridor will have three routes, as you can see in my presentation. Initial contracts for two demonstration pilot routes, and then the second point is with process of upscaling the capacity building. Now, the required infrastructure, I will just list, go through them quickly because of time. Uh, we will be doing terminals on both ends. We will be doing um, intermediate stops, pedestrian footways, pedestrian crossovers, foot bridges. Um, we'll be doing the drainages. We'll be doing at least two depots on either side so that this time we will maintain the rolling stocks. There will be proper uh, depots to do that. Public transport lanes will be introduced in certain side of the corridors. We will have junction improvements with street lights and traffic lights. Uh, parking management and um, a, a dry port and a truck, truck restriction. So these are all the infrastructure that we'll be introducing in this pilot corridor as we move on with the reform to help the formal transport, uh, informal to move to the formal. But I also want to say at this juncture that there will be clearly um, certain areas we are, that will interface with this corridor so that the, the private, the the um, informal sector will still continue to operate in a way that will not affect employment for youths. A lot of youths are employed in this sector currently in Freetown. And so we have to balance the transitioning with the livelihood and welfare of these people and how they grow. So some of them will train them into bus in the, to work in the depots some will be trained as uh, the formal drivers bus drivers some into mechanics but others who will still continue to to use the three wheelers we are organizing them in a way they will take from the fringes of the main corridor and bring people to empty them at the main corridor who would then catch the buses to move on so that is an important success factor for us as we engage with the um and three and two wheelers now, we are also bringing the, th the third aspect around my circle of reform is the vehicles themselves. Now, what we are introducing as a condition is that we have assessed and realized that the financial in, in capital is very low with the informal sector. So what we are doing is to, part of the reform is that we will introduce the first set of quality brand new buses that we will list to the companies that they are forming with the service standards clear. And part of this process, in order for us to recoup the money, we are also um, transforming a cash-based payment to drivers into a cashless payment system. And we have an independent um, hub that we collect and distribute to the different route operators and companies as the formula and the day goes by and the weeks go by. We are also considering that when you transition informal sectors, Mostly, most of them who owns the, these, these um, Puda Pudas or uh, two wheelers or three wheelers uh, or minivans, they do it. Some of them, most uh, half of them, by our research, wants use it to get money to go gift at home for food and clothing. So on a daily basis, they require some form of inflow of cash. Now, this we are taking this into consideration as we are transitioning, so that it might not be daily, but we might structure it to be some form of weekly cash flow as, as their um, payback period in terms of the collection of revenue. So this is also very important. But we are bringing quality uh, transport into the system. And uh, for us, we are currently bringing 200 buses into the system and it will rise up to about 400 buses because we need to do what we call um, the expected lead times of buses to move from one bus stop to the other but we are also looking at how to um, subsidize this because if we ask them the companies to move from one bus stop to the other whether it's two people or 20 people somebody has to pick up the tab and that is also being discussed and negotiated with the, the private sector but also with the, with the ministry of finance and um, in summary what will it take it will take to support for reform at the highest political level and i i am happy that we have the highest political support to get this going technical and well incentivized team of professionals it will also 
mean a formal institutionalized basis to coordinate across multiple agencies because of the disjointed nature I presented earlier of our current food sector. And then the willingness on the part of the private sector, bosses, associations and operators and drivers to be part of the reform program. And for, order, for you to buy that um, willingness, you've got to bring them from the start of the planning and to sit at the highest decision making body, the steering committee in our case. Then the ability to transform the SLRTC into a planner and regulator. And finally, effective land use controls and management of road space. And with this, like I started and opened, I will close to say we haven't got all the answers, but this is what Sierra Leone is doing and looking like. And as we evolve and grow up, we will share our experience more. With this, I want to say thank you to the listener, listeners. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Rondolo. This was an amazing presentation, and it's really inspiring uh, to see the role that the SLRTC can and will be uh, doing in the near future. Uh, we are starting to receive many questions from our attendees. We will get to those after the presentation of Mr. Angel. Uh, before we proceed, uh, some I will answer just a couple of technical questions. Uh, all of the presentations that we are having and hearing today will be made available to all of the attendees. If there are any problems with the sound, please feel free to disconnect from the call and reconnect and that should solve the problem. And uh, please feel free to add your questions in the question tab. We are monitoring them and I will read them out in the Q&A session. If you want to address your question to a particular panelist, please do so in drafting your question. And on this note, without further ado, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Angel Molinero. Mr. Angel is the Global Head of Government Relations of the Mexican Transportation and Mobility Association. He brings more than 40 years of experience in the public transportation sector. I feel in the presence of giants here. And is the General Manager of Ustran. His presentation today is about the Mexican experience and it's titled From Informal to Formal, A Change in Mentality. Mr. Angel, the floor is all yours. Oops, sorry. Good morning to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for the nice presentation. Now I'll be talking about informal, how we got from informal to formality and the need of a change in mentality. This will be basically focused on Mexico City's experience. When we see that uh, how the transportation, the public transportation has evolved in Mexico City, I will focus from really when I began to work on this, when the city uh, uh, created a, a and a company yeah. of seven, hello are you hello uh, when the city created a, a company of seven thousand hello 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 do you hear me no yeah no problem if we can hear you no well please continue uh, okay when the city created a company of 7,000 buses in the 81, 1981, uh, at the same time, uh, we who had uh, these informal uh, services given by what we call uh, peseros or colectivos that were really jitneys working or combis, uh, Volkswagen combis working on the on the system. As the, uh, as um, as a bus owned co city bus owned company uh, evolved, there were huge subsidies that they could not be handled by the city. Thirty four percent of all the budget of the city, Mexico City budget, which is quite a bit of money, went to public transportation. But it basically was to subsidize the operation of, of this own. Uh, bus owned company. 
It appeared an informal stage, a mini bus uh, system, and uh, really in, in, in 2005, we had a, uh, we returned back to a formalized system with the metro bus system, which was based on BRTs. Now, as an informal part, we are facing the shared taxi and the network transit companies, which really are a, a, form, uh, a, a way of informal transportation. How we return to formality? Well, all this disorder, pollution, accidents, bankrupt of a city-owned company, um, mini buses, a fleet of mini buses, more than 20 year old, induced for a change. We created a decentralized entity to regulate the BRT and the trunk corridors, which were about 33 of them, which are 33 uh, corridors. There were small changes really on the legal framework that was centered in the adoption of a new entity in the administrative context. We focus on the integration of, in, in, uh, of changing from individual permits to a, a global concession, a company concession, and the integration of bus companies. But basically, it was a change in mentality and image. There were, we created several bus companies. We, are, we work on the organization of these companies, the regulation of the system, and getting into the technical infrastructure. Really, the steps that we followed for a formal world were changing from individual permits to concession permits, changing from small vehicles, vans, and minibuses, basically, to 12 meter buses, articulated, be articulated, and double decker buses. The changing from the, form, the informal structure of one man, one bus, but changed to a, a partnership for, uh, formula. The, uh, the previous scheme of daily payment from the driver to the owner of the permit disappeared and there was a weekly payment from the company to the partners. The business was uh, on the hands of the driver and we changed it to a, central, uh, a centralized administration control. Maintenance was forgotten on the, in the previous scheme and of course, high cost we had. So we had to uh, change to economies of scale in fleet maintenance. There was an oversupply, no service programming, and we began programming the service. The stakeholders roles, really there were four or five uh, stakeholders, basic, uh, basic stakeholders. One was the trust that was created. The other ones was the fair collection entity the public entity that was in charge of the regulation, which is called Metrobus, and the bus operating companies. Of course, we cannot forget as a stakeholder, the user. The fair collection ent entity deposit the income and of course re receive a, pay a payment from the trust. And the trust paid Metrobus for the service. Metrobus also paid in a kilometer per of, of offer service base to the, oper the operating bus companies. This was an important change. No more payment, individual payment uh, per, per passenger, but by kilometer. This public entity, Metrobus, paid for cleaning and maintenance of stations, system safety, and of course, for contingencies that appear. The operating bus company paid the partners and the fixed cost, the variable cost and profit, and of course, they, they pay for the bosses. The city contribution basically was centered on investing on infrastructure. What were the key elements to achieve success? Well, was, one was leadership. A strong leadership and capacity to convince and transmit in a one-man, one-boss terminology what the change meant. This was an important thing. From the 80s, we had tried to change the system and it was very difficult because it was a, a consultant 
way of saying things, an authority way of saying things, and we cannot and we could not got get into the people that were really operating the system. I, we need a government willing to improve and believe both in the change not and in the transportation operators as partners of the change. This was also an important part to consider the people that work with in giving the service. The introduction of technology, first class buses, prepayment, central operating control, etc., and the use of the BRT concept to introduce a new look of what could be a better transportation system as, a, as well, I, we have to recognize, recognize as the excuse to integrate them. The integration of a professional team selected from the old individualized structure is permitted to empower the people that were working on the transportation sector. Two important things were that transportation people bought, bought the buses and operated the buses and the government invest in infrastructure and preparing. We work together, public, uh, the government and the private sector. There was also a need of changing the chip both in the users, passengers, operators, as well as authorities. And it's important to underline the authorities. Sometimes we think the, the, the only ones that have to change are the operator. We have to make informal drivers to understand that the idea is to provide a better service and not revenue checkups or pick up taxes that we wanted to improve the working conditions, dignify them and pass them from being a driver to a partner of a company. Convince them that they did not own the bus, but a share in the company. This was a tough part of the situation. They wanted, they don't, didn't want to lose the, the property of, the, of, of really the image of the bus. No more cash. cash. There was a centralized revenue management. Another important thing, money was not getting into their pockets. We had to train all the stakeholders and must to prof professionalize the transit sector by working together. It was not only training the drivers, but training the operator, training the authorities on what was a new transportation system. We, we did not take over the existing transportation people and build a new company as it has happened in other countries, but integrate and work with them and make part them uh, and make them part of the business. The change was as, was very slow, really. We we have about four years changing the system, and we had to convince several stakeholders. Key policies. Well, the first was to work with a network we had based on corridors, on several 33 corridors, and integrate technology and integrate by stages these aspects. We built up to now, from 2005 up to now, seven BRT lines, plus around 14 bus corridors. We bet for proven technology. We didn't want to try new technology, but proven technology. We bet for transport people and for change. We plan and implement it by stages. We, we, didn't, we didn't make the mistake of trying to implement all in, in one round, but by stages. First, BRTs and complementary corridors. We work a lot on the financial structure and the fair collection, the institutional structure, government and transport people. I, I, I want to under, underline this. We have to work together, the organizational structure. And the key was government invests in infrastructure, 
transport people or operate and invest in buses. Some questions we have, uh, we, may, we made uh, on, that, on that way. Do we have a transportation leader that, we ca that can deliver the message to the one man, one bus structure? This was an important and, and basic uh, aspect we, had, uh, we, we learned. It's an important thing to have a transportation leader from the transportation sector. Can we align the different stakeholders in the same road for going formal? It's difficult to align well, lots of uh, minibus, one, one bus, bus on, on the same line. It's difficult to align the, the authorities. It's difficult to align the financial part of the, the story. Another thing important is if the fair can cope with a formal structure that can that it, that is more expensive than informality as they will that it implies taxes social benefits organization much better bosses technology and so on this is important we began thinking that the formal structure will be cheaper and really it became more expensive can technology and new innovations help in the process of formalizing the transportation sector? To what extent? Technology is an important thing. It gives a new image and it helps a lot. Another question, an important question, can we break the fear for change? Transportation people have been living in a way their history on transportation and they know the, the way of making money. And now we come and say to them, there's an, another way, they are fearful for this. What carrots we need to make it feasible and keep up the change on the long run? A, an important thing when you're on crisis, better efficiency versus losing employment. Is this the right equation? And finally, what we are lo looking right now are we now promoting informality through formal schemes such as shared transit, network transportation companies, and the like? Thank you very much. I'm finished. Well, Mr. Angel, thank you very much for this amazing presentation. Uh, really, we learn a lot just by watching what happened in Mexico. And on this point, I would maybe ask uh, you to stay with us on the uh, panel keep your camera on please and mr hindulo to come and join us for we will take a couple of questions uh we're receiving multiple questions on the questions part of uh, go to webinar the software and uh, i will focus on the dedicated questions now and keep the general questions for the end of the webinar so we will tackle all questions that are raised and here maybe i will start uh, with two questions for you mr hindulo and I'll kindly ask you to try to keep your answers for uh, within uh, one minute so that we may uh, keep on track in terms of time for the webinar. So the questions come from Mr. Lawrence Venkail, and they are related first to the SLRTC. It's yet to transform into a regulator. So if that is still a process to happen, what is the current regulatory model for informal transport? And when we talk about the process of formalization, whether this means an intention to move away from the combi taxis to buses. Mr. Hindulo, the floor is all yours. Yes, quickly, two questions. Uh, the current um, regulatory environment, if we are currently in the process of transition, it's very loose and scattered and uncoordinated. There are different institutions with different mandates uh, that overlaps. Uh, so we have the, 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 the Metropolitan Police, we have the, the, the National Police, we have the Sierra Leone Road Safety Authority, we have the Sierra Leone Road Transport Corporation. All of these are bits and pieces as to how they interact with the um, informal sector currently. So the transitioning is going to codify this into one regulatory body. So that is what it is um, currently. And the second question is whether we are moving to small buses. Uh, I did not get that clearly into big buses. 
Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Yes, no, I was asking the second question was whether we are moving from small buses to big buses. I didn't get the second question clearly. Yes, whether the formalization process entails a shift from combis to bigger buses. Uh, well, we we have we are doing a key assessment of that currently, given the road space and even the, the the narrow structure of our roads in Freetown. We are doing what I call a mixed fleet, if for want of words. Uh, there are going to be smaller buses. There are going to be some bigger buses. We are looking at the peak time demands. We are looking at um, different sections of the road. So we are doing a mix a mixed fleet. Only that the same size of buses, but they will be in a very neat and structured manner. And, and in a very regulated state, but we are mixing the fleets. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Hindolo. And this really fits in also with the message that we got from Mr. Molinero about doing a staged approach where you start with the mixed fleets and then see what the following steps would be. If I move to you, Mr. Molinero, uh, we got on the questions a uh, comment that says, I really love Angel's presentation. It was very well rounded and thank you. So I just wanted to mention that quickly. And from here, we have two questions directed to you. And these are posed by Mr. Lola Lawrence Fenkel. So the first one is, in moving towards the formal transport system, do you still see a role for vans and minibuses in the value chain? And uh, this really reminds me of the uh, fear of change that you mentioned in your presentation. The second question is um, about the taxi mobility and pedestrian fund. So when Mexico City began regulating the e-hailing services such as Uber and Cabify, it put a requirement on drivers to contribute one and a half percent towards the taxi mobility and pedestrian fund. The question is, how did this contribute to promoting a movement from informal to a formal transport system? Mr. Molinero, the floor is all yours. Well, and I'll kindly ask you to try to run through the question. I'll go very quickly. Bands. I'm afraid myself that bands will come up due to these uh, short transit uh, schemes that are beginning to be worked on. So, and of course, bans, there are some corridors where they are, they are being used and are needed to be used bans. They cannot get into the mountainside, uh, very short, uh, narrow roads, etc. And on the side of Uber and uh, taxi, and uh, what has happened, well, really, it has become an informal, completely informal service where the authority in, in theory has a control, but in practice does not. So that will be a very synthetic scheme of what has happened in Mexico with Uber. It's, 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 it's used by a very sh small si uh, share of the mobility uh, split but really it, um, it, it's completely unregulated thank you well thank you very much uh i will ask a quick second mexico focused question and this one is by mrs amina dia she is asking that you mentioned that the bus service is programmed based on hourly demand can you please explain this point further? What does it mean in terms of practical implementation? Is there a technology that is used? Well, we, we, we are really doing a, a programming of, of uh, this BRT corridors basically on an hour, hourly uh, basis. Um, the, the, the technology that is being applied is Go all uh, bus uh, services, all bus services, as it's called. It's... Well, it's fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, we got a quick reaction to Mr. Hindolo, and it is an acknowledgement that often we believe that formal transport needs to be full sized buses, 
but that this mustn't be the case. You can have a formal service with smaller vehicles. On that point, I thank you very much, Mr. Hindulo and Mr. Angel, for your beautiful presentations. And I'll ask that we move forward to our third speaker today, Mr. Joachim Dragaro. Mr. Joachim is the project team leader of SMMR, which is the Sustainable Design of Urban Mobility in Middle-Sized Metropolitan Regions project that is getting implemented in Southeast Asia. It is a project implemented on behalf of the GIZ, and his presentation today will be titled Quality Partnerships Investment, Not Subsidy, which sounds like it's going to answer a question and a fear that a lot of people in the community have about informal transportation, the question of subsidies. Mr. Joachim, are you with us? Um, yes, I am here. I have to turn on my camera. This is it. And uh, you have allowed me to share my presentation? Yes, you should yes, be able to, to present it here. Yes, absolutely. So that Fantastic. Me... Are you having it? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Please. To proceed. Good. Um, I was already introduced. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, my name is Joachim Bergerhoff, team leader. I have one slide to present the project itself. But the easiest thing to do is for you to go to our website, summer.asia. Um, we do address all medium-sized metropolises that we can get in touch to um, in the ASEAN region. But we have also three metropolitan regions with whom we work more uh, closely on, in our project. Our aim is to enable, put into practice, the avoid, shift, improve approach, which predecessor projects have uh, managed to implement in the Kuala Lumpur strategic plan and in the regional uh, ASEAN regional sustainable land transport uh, strategy. So now we go to the next step of operationalizing these, these good uh, principles, which are also well common well-known in uh, SSATP, for instance. But there is a much more fundamental concept, which we all know, of course, sustainability, but which we sometimes tend to uh, forget in all its uh, aspects. Uh, and especially in transport, we are well familiar with the concept of uh, environmental sustainability, do not accumulate environmental hazards. And also in the social field, we know that we should care for and cater for uh, not accumulating social grievances. But in our sector, this often leads to people thinking, well, this will cost something. And uh, so we have to spend on, uh, on meeting these targets. And we tend to forget that actually in the economic field, we also have the same kind of principles. Do not accumulate deficits. Have I advanced myself too fast? Anyway, the point here is to show that in the transport business, which is result oriented uh, economically in the economic sphere and in mobility policy, which is the field of many of us, we do have the same kind of process and, uh, and well, categories we have to work with, even if we use different, different terminologies. So a transport business will have a business plan, while in the policy field, we speak about the sustainable urban mobility plans, which we want to put into practice. And in the end, they all boil down to, to making an application to the funder application to a bank for a loan in order to, to run the business, to finance it, or an application to a funding institution that is willing to invest in the transport system that we are proposing. Move forward.
Okay. And so actually we are in a market of transport services, the, the mobility services market, whether we look at it from the business point of view or from the sustainable urban mobility point of view. And the market success is determined by the optimal uh, development of those seven P's of marketing, which we learn in business school. And well, it, it comes to seven P's when we talk in business language. Uh, those all together should create the fare box revenue, generate the fare box revenue that meet the costs of the operators. And we are in a subsidy free, uh, free market uh, service. But then, this has switched to, to a different mode here. Anyway, next. But then come the public authorities and start complaining about uh, the services that the, the self financed independent operators do provide and from the other side from the behind the scenes they start to influence those five p's and they, instead of talking about uh, the product they talk about transport systems instead of talking about promotion they talk about regulations about instead of letting the market fix prices they impose concessionary fees instead of letting operators go where the clients are they do planning and tell the operators where to go and so forth and they do all this in view of generating external benefits and accounting to their objectives in the social and environmental uh, sustainability field but as a result it may well happen that those seven P's, which also determine the outcome of the operations, start to, to generate less fare box revenue because they are not optimized day by day by the operator in function of the reality in the field. And the public authorities say, okay, well, this, this is normal because we are also asking for some some uh, adaptations from our side in order to meet our social and environmental uh, criteria and so in order to maintain a certain level of of service which they expect they start to agree paying operating subsidies in order to meet the costs of operation and in many places this does work to a certain extent uh, uh, we can all testify, and this is actually a, a very, a very common situation. But it also entails a big risk, because it is not certain that all these good measures and these policies of the public authorities really do increase the social and environmental benefits a lot. But it is certain that there is a strong flow of money, of resources going from one domain to the other and that the operators uh, are not incited anymore, enticed anymore to improve their, uh, their their bottom line. And so we enter a, uh, a vicious circle of what I call the poor market facilitation by the public authorities which induce a lack of market response, less fair box revenue, and oblige them to pay subsidies, which then lack um, for improving the operating conditions and further strengthen the vicious circle, which in the end leads all the way to, uh, well, high prices and formalization, informalization of the transport system. And we've seen from Mexico, for instance, this, this history, uh, it may well be this uh, vicious cycle of, of public authority driven uh, marketing that has led to 
to too high uh, operating deficits and the bankruptcy of the system. Well, this brings us to another concept which is clo uh, closely related, which is resilience. Resilience is the sustainability in times of crisis. And we have mentioned the, the current crisis uh, around the world. And I have here four photos with five transport services in Phnom Penh, where I reside, where our headquarters are. Um, and I ask you the question, of these five services that we can see here, which one receives public subsidies and which one stopped operating in April this year? Uh, it's not the yellow one, it's not the red one, and it is not the two and three wheeled ones. So it is important, of course, to have public policy, but we must never neglect the, the strength and the dynamism of the private sector in any circumstance and against all odds. And so the term of quality partnership, many of you will recognize it, uh, comes from the policies that were developed in the United Kingdom after uh, Lady Thatcher uh, stipulated that there should be no more operating subsidies to public transportation. And which obliged the, uh, the transport authorities to change, uh, to change their, their policies and assume their responsibilities. And so they developed the policy of quality partnership in which the roles of the, uh, the operators and the authorities are very well distinguished. And the authorities limit their role to creating the conditions for operating benefits. And the operators have the task to actually materialize them. And on each side of, of this circle of uh, seven Ps, there is enough work for, for each of the actors to, to contribute to making this a success. The nicest example of how this cooperation and this market facilitation can operate is given by the central market. Here we have a photo of uh, Phnom Penh in 1960, where we have here the big uh, central market, uh, which is a public institution, but which hosts the service of the traders of uh, uh, well, grocery and all sorts of uh, uh, common consumption goods. So a clear cooperation between the public as a market facilitator, the provider of the market, the regulator of the market, as we mentioned, and the private operators doing their best to seduce the, the client. And actually in the foreground, we do have the coach station or the intermodal mobility hub of the same year next to the market, which is not a coincidence and which worked very much in the same way, a public institution that provides the, the, uh, the roof, if you like, for the, for the market of transport and mobility services. Both institutions are still existing and operating today, but of course they have lost many of the market shares. But the, the concept is still the same, and it is being uh, adapted, upgraded to, uh, to the, the urban transport systems of the day. And we see this very clearly here, in this uh, depiction of the transit-oriented development uh, approach. So we were uh, invited to, to highlight the aspects of BRT. And BRT, indeed, is another textbook example of the application of the same principles of cooperation between public and private for the optimal uh, assembly and configuration of these seven Ps of the marketing mix in order to achieve sustainability and, and implement the ASI policy. In Southeast Asia, we have a few uh, BRT systems, 
which I will very shortly present here just for the sake of launching a discussion. The only one that actually has a world renomee and status is the Trans Jakarta in Indonesia, which has been operating since uh, for the last 15 years, and it boasts being the longest uh, BRT network in the world. And we have here uh, a beautiful picture of the central, uh, central bus stop in Jakarta, and we can we can feel that it really has an impact uh, on the mobility scene in in the city in the metropolitan region with more than 800,000 daily users uh, in a in a metropolitan region of 35 million so it has a strong impact in places where it is implemented in such a uh, beautiful way as here but it is not implemented at all in most parts of the city and it is still expanding but it is a public system and it does require subsidies. So the question is whether it will be able to expand enough to really change the whole transport system. Then we have Bangkok, where we also have a beautiful picture of a BRT uh, corridor. But uh, the aspect, the experts among you will quickly spot a number of, uh, of difficulties, of course, in this corridor. There are many more people queuing up in cars and on motorbikes uh, on this corridor than there are people, sorry, riding the small vehicles uh, circulating on on uh, on this BRT corridor. And indeed, uh, this was not a success. And after seven years of operations with high operating deficits, uh, by a a public company, the whole system had to be closed down. Then uh, we have the Sunway Line, Malaysia, which is a beautiful uh, system that ticks all the right boxes of PPP, TOD, and so forth. But uh, we cannot really look at it as a urban transport system because uh, it is much too short, only five kilometers with seven stations. But it is a very inspiring uh, example of a first attempt to, to apply principles, but not at the right scale in the right place. And in most places, we do talk about the BRT, but uh, there are no implementations. There are more projects in Vientiane, in Phnom Penh, in Hanoi, but in many places, BRT just does not uh, take off. Also because it is not conceived as, well, it has many problems, especially in Southeast Asia, where, where cities are very dense, as you can see in the background, and growing very fast and rail systems should have more uh, more success and so actually the the transport system is dominated by rail informal transport to come back to this and uh, two wheelers so just in order to to summarize and uh, and conclude uh, the the point i would like to contribute to our discussion is the clear distinction between political investment and commitment to the reform of the transport system and the willingness to pay operating subsidy. And we see that in places like, like, uh, like Manila, the last example, we have low political uh, will and the system to be installed would be uh, very costly in uh, in operating subsidies and so the whole system doesn't doesn't go forward we had the same example in Bangkok. what we have in informal transport is that we have low commitment by the political sphere to uh to the transport system but fortunately the self-regulation of the informal sector allows to operate with uh, low subsidy 
so the system works. And we have good practice examples of formal systems where the government allocates resources to the system which is set up as it likes it to be. But we see that the government never has enough resources to cover a whole metropolitan area with the system uh, of the high standards that, that uh, it wants for political reasons. And so my suggestion is not that we, we try to, to transform the, the self-regulated uh, informal transport systems into government regulated uh, subsidized systems, but that both of these systems coexist and together and each of them evolve towards a system of quality partnerships where the roles of public and private actors are clearly understood and, uh, and played in a, in, a, in a partnership spirit between both of them. So no case study here, but uh, a contribution, hopefully, to, to a more general discussion about the great experts uh, who are in the seminar today. Um, which leads me to the concluding slide of thank you very much. Don't hesitate to be in touch and uh, establish the link to Southeast Asia with us. Thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Joachim, thank you very much for your presentation today. We are uh, a little bit behind time, and because of this, I feel a special obligation to thank you for joining us too late. For those who don't know, Mr. Joachim is joining us from Cambodia, where it's 10 p.m. tonight. So thank you very much. And I will ask you uh, one question, and then we'll move to the next presentation uh, that I'm seeing repeated in uh, multiple questions, actually. In informal transportation, you often have people at the bottom of the pyramid who are really trying to put food on the uh, table. And when you have this absolute profit motive that's about survival, how can you entice a shift from thinking purely about getting money to thinking about quality service provision? How do we manage that in this low subsidy, high regulation uh, environment that you advocate for? Well, the, the informal operators do need to find clients every day, in the morning and in the evening. So they cannot do this without quality. So, so probably uh, many of us as observers, as, as, as transport experts, observers of the scene, have a different concept of, trans of quality of service than the clients. And obviously, as long as the clients continue to use the service, some of them are captive probably, but there is a strong competition between different operators. Well, the quality cannot be that bad. And it is precisely this, this necessity to make ends meet on a daily basis or better on a monthly basis or yearly basis that entices the operator to really be close to the market and not close to some abstract uh, measures of, uh, of quality. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Joachim. And on that note, I think that we will move to our next speaker, Mr. Uh, Benjamin de la Peña. I would like to just take a moment to thank all of our panelists sure. and of our attendees for sticking with us. We are running approximately 15 minutes behind schedule, but it's really because of the wealth of information that's presented, like uh, we just need to learn here. And on this, I'm really honored to present Mr. Benjamin de la Peña. He is the founder and director of Agile City Partners. And parallel to it, he writes and curates Makeshift Mobility which is a newsletter that's published online that covers innovations in informal transportation. And today he'll be presenting uh, Making Sense of Makeshift Mobility about his understanding of the sector and the innovations that are taking place within it. And a final note, he also works or was working as the Chief of Strategy and Innovation at the Seattle Department of Transportation. So really bringing the understanding of both informal systems, formal systems, the theoretical lens to really compare both and derive lessons. And on this point, Mr. Benjamin, 
the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Mohammed, and thank you to the rest of the panelists, and thank you to all of the uh, attendees today on these, this virtual uh, workshop on important transportation. Um, so I will give kind of pull out 40,000 feet more. I'll try to make my presentation uh, uh, under 10 minutes in respect to Mr. Erhan so that we can have further discussions. Uh, a little bit more about myself. I, we talked about Agile City Partners. We're a small consulting firm. We're focused on agility uh, and helping governments become uh, more agile and more responsive, very much needed in this time of big pivots that we need to happen. I write Makeshift Mobility, a newsletter. You can subscribe uh, by going to makeshiftmobilitysubstack.com. Uh, a couple of the other projects, uh, we created a strategic document for managing information, which is a key skill that departments of transportation and transit agencies need to have now. Uh, the way the transportation system is going to be managed or is already being managed is through transportation information, and we need to have a plan for that. Uh, also wrote the new mobility playbook, uh, wrote a monograph on innovations in informal transportation earlier in the last decade, and I've been involved in developing the BRT standard, uh, informal city dialogues, the start of city camp and trans transportation camp. Leave you this quick quote that is important, and I think Mr. Uh, uh, Minister uh, Hindelot, uh, Hin, Hin, if I'm saying his name right, uh, um, clarified very early on that you need to understand the whole system, understand what's happening in order to have an effective intervention. Um, skip on that one. So one of the things I pull out from, which may not be news to the participants of this uh, workshop, is that informal transportation is a global phenomenon. Uh, but very often we treat this as a local problem, but it's global, which means we have to understand why does it emerge? It's not just the local quirks that lead to informal transportation. A little bit of the proof on how global it is, right? So uh, here are three wheelers, right? You've got Pakistan's three wheelers, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and India, auto rickshaws and tuk-tuks. Uh, the same mode of transportation sometimes imported into has happened in uh, northern africa and, and east africa and west africa and also in uh, the americas right in latin america in southeast asia as was mentioned earlier so these three wheelers and and i will talk a little bit more of their kind of genealogy where they come from uh emerge right because they're very useful for narrow roads and bringing not just people but goods uh, so we have to understand how they serve the system and when it comes to minibuses it's the same thing right and it's not just so you've got the jeepney in the Philippines, the Songtao, if I'm saying it correctly, uh, in northern Thailand uh, and also Vietnam, the Matatu, classic Matatus, uh, the Colectivos and Teseros of Latin America, the Tap Taps of uh, uh, the Caribbean, and in East uh, Europe, actually, the Marstruska, if I'm, again, I forgive my pronunciation, which are really the Matatus of uh, Belarus and Georgia and Russia. And you've got the dollar vans of New York and the Van Jai or the mini buses of Hong Kong. So it is not just uh, a phenomenon that happens in the emerging economies or the developing world. Uh, these services emerge because there's a demand for it uh, and there's availability of vehicles. And then we go to two, two uh, wheelers, right? The Boda Bodas, Ojex, Okadas, Motorsize, and Moto Taxis, Zioms, uh, they're all over. Um, and so we need to step back and say, and we're not even talking about the pedal-powered informal transit. Why does it emerge? And uh, this is a uh, going back to my point. It's a global phenomena, and yet we tend to treat it as a local problem. Um, I'm glad that UITP for the past four years has been slowly elevating informal transportation. One of the things that was very shocking to me as I was doing research in this space is we don't even have a global estimate of the carbon output or the GHG emission output of informal transportation. Uh, and that should be really important as we face climate change, right? And we try to tackle it. But we treat it as a local problem. Uh, and there are no large institutes that say, here's one way to solve it. And I'm glad that the workshop like this allows us to trade this information. But it should be studied uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, researched well, well, right? Um, we need to understand the system that generates informal transportation. This is going to be a very busy slide. 
Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about it. So informal transportation emerges uh, through many layers. You can think of this as a stack, right? First is the from the bottom, right? The history of this in society where the country or the city is. And in many cases, it's a history of colonialism or racism where areas of the cities are not served, usually the poorer areas or the areas where they're people of particular ethnicities, right? And those people need to get around. And so therefore, uh, these, uh, these services emerge to cater to them. In the meantime, the elite of the city or the governing elite tend to not notice that these actually services exist or they're seen as nuances, despite the fact that they are critical to the urban economy. Uh, economic policy is important, rather, right? how a city thinks about or a country thinks about their investment in transportation where it's all market led. Um, and uh, a lot of this, the disinvestment from formal transportation started happening in the 80s and the 90s when uh, the multilateral agencies and both the Washington Consensus and the Chicago School of uh, Neoliberalism and saying we need to disinvest in, in city services, right, started happening. The infrastructure, whether it's automobile centric, um, and therefore, if it's automobile centric, then it's individual vehicles that matter, and so smaller vehicles are uh, uh, are picked, and that's also why you see a lot of a rise of two wheelers, right? Because uh, if individual vehicle uh, travel is much more important than uh, than individual purchase of vehicles, becomes the solution for people who need to get around. Uh, the sprawl and density, low density, high density, low low rise sprawl creates these the 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 city structure that works better for informal transportation because you can't fit buses in them. Um, the adaptability and affordability of vehicles that are available, right? Whether there's cheap uh, two-stroke engines, motorcycles coming from exported from China or old World War II equipment. Uh, or old buses, that also plays a role. Uh, the way this, the government treats transportation, is it uh, treated as a micro enterprise rather than a critical public utility, um, which then engenders hyper competition as Mr. Bergerhoff earlier mentioned, right? We layer it on with fare collection, which means that the operators have very, very slim margins. And so there is no space for maintenance, much less for reinvestment in vehicles. Um, mobility policies and regulations, the primacy of traffic management over commuter needs, and I've seen this in city after city, the most engagement that informal transportation has from government is traffic management and not about the movement of people or the comfort of the commuters. Um, then there's local culture, right? The celebration of make-do ingenuity, which usually arises also from this history of, of oppression. Um, and music, songs, and art and self-expression, if you've seen Matatus in Kenya or the jeepneys in the Philippines or the uh, minibuses in Pakistan, these are celebrations of culture and art and expression. Uh, and we need to recognize that, right? So replacing them with uh, boring minibuses takes away something from society. And finally, this emerging layer of technology, right? Ride Hegel and payments. Uh, digital mapping and journey planning apps are uh, part of the system that is we need to deal with. A little bit of the history, right? The Mazda Go 3, which was a Japanese product. And in the uh, before World War II, they started exporting this to Southeast Asia. That became the pre, uh, progenitor of the tuk-tuk and the auto rickshaw. Um, the Sankyo Type 97, which was a World War, again, World War II uh, vehicle from the Japanese military, a lot of which were left in the battlefields, uh, became converted into tricycles in the Philippines. And then again in the Philippines, the flat pack military jeep of World War II, uh, you know, after the city was destroyed, this became very easy. You had a lot of people who knew how to put these together. And so therefore, these became informal transportation, right? The other, which people have also already mentioned, is it runs on a vehicle rent system. So it's a daily income. And usually uh, the drivers earn only whatever they can earn above the daily rent they're paying to the vehicle owner, which means every passenger is potential income. And we need to shift that if we are going to change, if we're gonna transform informal transportation. Uh, in terms of reach, right? Uh, this is from the London School of Economics mapping what they call popular transit uh, versus formal transit. And, and there is no way formal transit 
uh, part particularly with larger vehicles, can ever have the coverage of informal transit across the city. So we need to embrace that and figure out how to make it work. And I'm glad for the examples of cities that are making it work. Um, so on to handholds or affordances in the system that we can start thinking of within the whole system. Uh, here are some examples, right? So foremost among them is how do we pay for transportation in our cities? Um, um, uh, Mr. Berghoff, Hawkey mentioned London, right? And, and their move to privatization and taking subsidies away from uh, transit. And that has changed because of congestion pricing, where congestion pricing pays for uh, buying more and upkeeping transportation. And I think we need to do that in our cities uh, and say, this is uh, kit, transportation is a critical utility how do we pay for it and it's not just through the fare box change that and you can change the behavior of the rest of the system looking rather than at buying new vehicles also thinking about is there an approach of a kit of parts approaches particularly to three-wheelers right and this is happening in india when it comes to electrifying auto rickshaws a uh, service contracting where the government pays the, uh, the uh, informal transport operators to run by kilometer uh, which Mexico had showed us, right? And fleet management services, prioritizing people movement in our uh, transportation policy, figuring out how do we bring in local arts uh, and designs, and then uh, how do we use the existing, uh, the emerging digital infrastructure to manage the transportation system. Um, key point, you can transform informal transportation if you focus on vehicles alone or traffic management alone or regulation alone. The picture behind that is ADB's investment in the Philippines in new electric three-wheelers, which failed because they were bigger. They, in theory, they could carry more. Um, they cost more for the operators, but the operators could repair a two-stroke engine. They did not know how to repair an electric engine, and there was no charging infrastructure. So that was a 500 million, I think, dollar investment um, that failed after two or three years. So we need to think about how do we do, how do we integrate and approach it from a system. How fast is this moving? Um, here's what it is, right? So this is just on two wheelers uh, and three wheelers, which uh, used to have queues, right? That you would either hail on the street or there were queues that you could then walk to, or you, if they had landlines nearby, you could call them. Then we started seeing text to ride or call centers, particularly in India where you would call and then they would send you, they would route you uh, an auto rickshaw. Then the ride hailing apps have all appeared. Uh, so Gojek and Ola and Halan and Gokada, uh, which is making it easier for the operators uh, and maybe might provide good information that governments can run the transportation system in. But uh, they need to get ahead of that because a new thing that's happening in India is uh, rebelling against the 37% or 30% that Uber and Ola take from the the fair, uh, they've turned to WhatsApp and used WhatsApp as a messaging app so that then they can find their own customers and so are, are, are bypassing that control uh, of, of the operator, of the ride hailing apps. And the ride hailing apps themselves are not concerned very much about how the transportation system works. They're much more concerned in capturing payment systems. So we need to get ahead of, of that. Uh, lastly, is a quick question I think other speakers have talked about. How do we define success? I don't like the term formalizing because it tends to imagine some uh, 20, first 20th century, 19th century hierarchical approach to transportation. And I like the term transforming, right? How do you take the best parts of informal transportation? It's agility, it's responsiveness, um, and take that and, and marry it with customer satisfaction, which by the way, even formal transportation agencies don't do a good job of checking. And then the livelihoods that you are affecting. These are huge numbers. Um, 500,000 uh, people are employed by Matatus in Nairobi somehow, right? And so losing that is a, going to be a big economic drain. Uh, and so we have to figure out what is our definition for success in transforming uh, informal transportation. And it has to be both the people who use it and the people who operate it. They have to be key to that. That's it. Thank you. Uh, if you scan that uh, uh, QR code, you'll get to subscribe to my newsletter. Happy to hear more of your thoughts. And I hope I covered it all. Sorry 
if I rush through it. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Benjamin. This was a really insightful presentation. I will invite to the floor Mr. Erhan to come and join us and to present as well. We will combine the questions for the two final presentations together. Uh, if I might uh, introduce Mr. Erhan Unku, who is a transport planner with more than 47 years of experience working in the domain. Mr. Erhan is principal and owner of UART, which is a consultancy company that he co-founded in 1991, and he is a UITP Honorary Ambassador. He'll be talking to us today about the governance of informal public transportation in Turkey, the experience and the recovery and reorganization resulting from the current uh, pandemic. Mr. Erhan, we're really glad to have you. The floor is all yours. Can we turn off the camera again? Mohammed. Can you see my screen? Yes. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your screen, Mr. Erhan. Please do feel free to proceed. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will, uh, first of all, I, will uh, I would like to thank you for inviting me to share uh, Turkish experiences and uh, present uh, my views uh, to such a, a large uh, audience. My presentation has two parts. In the first part, I will have a, a, rough, a general definition of informal transport, then the informal uh, public transport types in Turkey, and the effects of informal transport and role of inform informal transport in Tur Turkish cities. In the second part, I will uh, uh, discuss the effects of pandemic, pandemics, COVID-19 to uh, informal uh, transport sector and uh, how to uh, get out of this uh, hard uh, conditions with reorganization and solution, solution with the existing problems. Uh, informal transport in the 70s were defined with four major uh, items, four criteria. Be having a fixed route, fixed fare, fixed schedule and open to public. And uh, it was, then it was called as paratransit. When you look at those, we see that municipal buses, uh, rail, urban rail, and ferries uh, have all of those four uh, items, four criteria. But the other uh, informal public transport uh, uh, modes or operations, uh, individually operated public buses, minibuses, employee buses, uh, and uh, taxis, doesn't have those four essential criteria. And uh, since the uh, 70s, we have a, a, a technical changes and operational changes that brought us new criteria uh, to really have the public, to be a public transport, like mass production, institutional uh, production, or size of the operations, integration of the services, ticketing technology, uh, shared integrated ticketing, integrated pricing, Transfer, uh, transfer fares, schedules, special design at the uh, station stops and transfer centers, and network design, uh, not competing but com complementing routes on the system. And finally, the new standards of uh, having social services that are not profitable, vehicle standards, adherence to uh, schedules, comfort and occupancy uh, standards, <laughs> and social security like items define the new public transport uh, definition. 
And in Turkey, uh, informal transport started in the 30s, but really we saw it in the 50s after urbanization, rapid urbanization and immigration to the cities. So people want to solve their own uh, transportation problems, uh, started their own vehicles with uh, new routes, lines, and they needed regulations and limitations to market entry to protect themselves. Currently, in Turkish cities, besides the rail and maritime modes, we have municipal buses as the formal public transport. Then individually operated public buses. They, are, they start with the 17 seaters to uh, articulated buses and uh, double uh, two-story uh, buses, double-deck buses, minibus dolmuşuz, generally started with nine uh, cap person capacity vehicles and now currently uh, 14, 15, 17 uh, capacity and taxi dolmuşuz just are shared on uh, shared taxis on fixed routes and what we call service buses which are actually uh, school buses, company buses uh, and employee buses and the taxis, of course, the last two are not co may not be considered as, as informal public transport, but since there is a, a limitation on the, uh, the blue ones, the real informal public transport, the municipalities and the people has found solution with the increasing of the, uh, the service bus fleet. And with the uh, informal public transport of, uh, operators, we have seen an uh, adverse effects to the uh, urban uh, transportation system, like deterioration of the network. Uh, as planners, we would like to uh, plan a line from A to B as short as possible. We adjust it to the street pattern and adjust it to the uh, locations, but can operators come into the screen they like this kind of uh, routes. And the, the right picture is a route and in Antalya. So you don't know where is A, where is B. And it also reflects on the face of the vehicles. There are uh, many uh, different uh, locations. Destination uh, plates are full of different locations from A to Z. So this is not efficient routes, network, and lines are not efficient. The, uh, the second uh, dis disadvantage of the uh, private single owner operator advantage, uh, this is the number of routes uh, on the uh, Antalya uh, bus network, minibus network, and number of lines on each street. As you can see, there are uh, 86 uh, lines on one street. And uh, uh, this was the before the uh, restructuring. And when we implemented re restructuring, the, the number of uh, lines dropped to the blue figure. But in a few months, with the pressures of the uh, passengers and operators, some of them again increased to yellow uh, bars. But we tried to keep the central city uh, only with main routes, but not all the routes. This deformation comes because of the, uh, there is no transfer fares. There is no transfer. All the lines need to start from the rural areas or uh, housing areas and go into the city center. And each year they go deeper into city, deeper into city, and there is a real congestion on the main streets, the turbulence of buses, minibuses, turbulence of passengers in the main street, which cause a general con congestion and inefficiency. Safety and comfort standards is also a problem because the operators uh, wants to, uh, to have more occupancy because it really uh, means money. Uh, revenue for them and uh, their operation standards safety standards are also uh, missing uh, at worst in this one for example you can see a minibus driver 
drinking tea, smoking cigarette, talking on phone, and collecting cash while he drives the minibus. And uh, since they operate on cash, there is no operational and even ownership data. There are how many drivers, how many hours of the day it is being used and operated. And there is no or very limited integration uh, in the system and operations. They don't uh, consider social service uh, aspect uh, of the uh, public transportation. They prefer to op uh, operate on uh, profitable routes and uh, pr profitable uh, times of the day. Uh, they create very low tax revenue for the uh, state. But most important of all adverse effect is the creation of a market value of the license, which is created by scarcity value because the entry to the market is frozen. So the number is same, but the cities are growing so the passenger number is, is uh, growing. So we have an ever, ever increasing value due to the frozen market entry. It becomes a tradable asset at the market. And this is the root problems of the de deformations. The system of the paratransit or informal transportation doesn't have a fixed uh, time contract. They uh, operate uh, without any time limitation. Coming to Turkish cases, Turkey is uh, between, uh, just uh, at the center of the three co continents and we have 85 million population uh, highly concentrated on three cities, 16 million in Istanbul, uh, 6 million uh, in Ankara and 5 million in Izmir and the, the others are uh, between uh, five and, uh, one, 500 uh, and 1 million uh, 20 cities and 20 uh, below those. If we consider the operation types of the different uh, operations, uh, informal transport operations, just uh, to consider with the four essential uh, items, criteria of the transit, and uh, electronic fare collection, uh, stop operation or hail stop operation, integration with other modes, standard contracts, plate value and time contracts. We see that taxi dormitories doesn't uh, have a, even essential uh, aspect of the uh, informal uh, transit. Minibus uh, dormitories also misses uh, many of those and have, have the highest plate value. In uh, some cases, in some cities, parts of this city, there, uh, there are uh, line plates which is about five times uh, of the real vehicle value. So the real value of the uh, informal transport is the uh, plate value. We have uh, individual operator buses, contracted buses, and uh, uh, what we call uh, service buses, school bus, employer and company buses, but they are not open to the public. And if you consider the public uh, size of the informal operations, this is results of the uh, 2012 survey, Izmir city with uh, about 4 million population, 81%, more than 80% of the fleet is owned by the single owner operators. In Ankara, it is about 82%. And in Istanbul, it's about 94% of the fleet uh, of the urban transportation system, besides rail, is owned by the single owner operators. And uh, last week, there was a, a change that uh, these individual operated buses will operate under municipal uh, fleet. But uh, during the last uh, eight years, there was a huge increase in the employee buses. The number doubled for the thing. Uh, the cities has been trying formalization of the individual operators uh, last 10 years, but uh, it has not been uh, solved and a very limited number of the 
steps are taken. And what pandemic uh, has done uh, to informal sector, there is a reduction in trip production rates. E shopping, stopping unnecessary trips, limiting social act act activities, closure of education, etc. And also, uh, one other reason is to shift to other modes, car, bike, and walking, which caused a reduced demand. Then there was also a government-led government decisions, capacity restrictions in the vehicles, tight control of occupancy, disinfection requirements, which led to reduced revenues and additional costs, which uh, resulted with the financial uh, crisis, which is uh, trying to be solved. But even this tight control of, of occupancy reflects in the uh, daily uh, transportation like this. So actually the informal transport is not highly uh, affected from the strict cont controls. And uh, coming uh, to the solutions, what should be our uh, strategies and objectives for both recovery and restructuring of the system? We have to redefine networks and services because uh, private operators, single owner operators has distorted the system. We have to restructure tendering and contracts. We have to restructure client organizations. We have to separate operators from corridors, cash, vehicles, staff, and rights. Because uh, they have, they, uh, one day they may operate in one corridor, in the second day they might have uh, operation on the other corridor. Otherwise, they own that uh, corridor, they think it's their property, and they start to sell it in the market. There, are, there were two, uh, two ways uh, to solve this problem. One is, uh, has been tried for about 10 years, which is pooling, uh, started with operator initiatives. And the first one is the uh, network restructuring first step and electronic pay collection is essential because of the uh, collecting passenger data and revenues uh, for the pool. The second pool is the line pool that enables uh, operators to uh, operate on both uh, profitable and non-profitable -profit routes. Revenue and cost pools that uh, money and cost are done from a common uh, pool. And the fleet pool and employee pool and finally the uh, rights pool. This has been tr uh, tried in the last uh, tw 15, 10 years, but uh, there was not success in most of the implementations. Only a few cities has came up to a cost control pool and revenue pool uh, and stayed there, didn't go further. So uh, the, an alternative strategy for uh, operations and restructuring and recovery of the informal sector is the need to it needs to start with the municipality in, initiative as the unbounding of the services. Again, to start with networking and uh, electronic pay collection, uh, and according to uh, COVID-19 requirements, increase capacity capacity of the buses and numbers and with new lines, hire new staff and hire new ve vehicles. And uh, at the, uh, finally, uh, my rent by rights. And repeat these uh, with starting from the network structuring and try to get improve the situation. As a conclusion, we can say that we need to restructure management and redesign. We need to have an operation planning and coordination center. And uh, currently all Turkish operators uh, have private operators under public operators uh, sub, uh, sub 
which is not creating an even uh, an equitable system. And uh, then we need to increase capacity of the uh, services with new players according to COVID-19 requirements. Focus on new pl players and rules, allow new conditions to lead current pl uh, pl players, use new conditions to define a better f uh, feature, and we shall not uh, focus on the symptoms, which is uh, losing money, but we have to focus on roots of the problem. Thank you. Sorry for the rush. Mr. Erhan, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I apologize uh, on behalf of all of us organizers on the time that uh, ran a little bit outside of us. So I thank you very much for hurrying through the final questions. If I might to conclude the uh, webinar, ask all of the panelists to come and join me and turn on their cameras. Um, I think that today we had five presentations presenting multiple case studies, multiple geographies, multiple topics. We have a lot of questions. We have taken account of all of the questions that were answered in the chat and all, all of the unopened questions. We will, uh, the UITP will try to reply through them via email by reaching out to the panelists following the webinar. Uh, so we will try to do that. And maybe the main topics that I got out of today were questions related to subsidies and whether these are an effective mechanism or not. A main question was about the market dynamics that govern the sector, be it for in the high level of dynamism that come that we may not underestimate and that might be leveraged powerfully, but also the impacts that this leave on any interventions that we might do. Uh, I, I also heard a lot of discussion about the vicious circles that can ensue and that can sometimes be exacerbated by interventions that are not the most effective. The negative external costs that are levied by the uh, sector at some points that need interventions that are effective to tackle them. On this note, I'll maybe leave the floor to Mr. Fezula to give some final closing remarks, followed by Mr. Mustafa Ben Ammar. And uh, finally, Arthur will give two final words about the next webinar. Mr. Fezula, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Mohamed. Uh, this was very, uh, I mean, uh, good. Uh, webinar you know this is the one of the magnificent seminar that i have ever had in the topics of informal transport i would like to take, uh, thank all of the uh, i mean speakers here uh, that uh, shared very very high level uh, uh, presentations but uh, we understand that formalization is not an easy task but it is very complex problem but uh, we are lucky that there is a solution solutions we have seen around the world uh, solution is possible but there are uh, in the to solve the problems there are many stakeholders we have to uh, include all the stakeholders into the solutions you know for example in uh, one of our colleagues talk about the uh, uh, passenger association one of the big uh, important stakeholder is the uh, pass our passenger so we have to put all the uh, we have to put the uh, passenger into the solution not into the problems because they are facing the problems and they are they want to have the solution of the problems so we have seen here that uh, also uh, there is no one solution each city has its own solutions but uh, the goals are same so the goals are to uh, provide high quality of service to our passengers and safe service secure service and maybe passenger requires to have also the service cheap so uh, by considering formalization maybe in benjamin says that not the formalization transforming uh, by considering the formalization to keep uh, the service is cheap comfortable uh, safe and cheap also 
as we have seen that the uh, informal sector has very dynamic you know service uh, in terms of uh, scheduling so we have to keep also uh, that time and dynamism into the uh, formalization so uh, again i would like to thank all of the uh, speaker here and uh, all of the attendees here i hope that they got very very uh, well information regarding formalization of the informal sector and i would like to thank uh, you uh, mohammed also you have a uh, very well moderate uh, i mean seminar and also uitp team uh, emmanuel and arthur and also our partners uh, world bank and ssatp thank you very much thank you very much mr fezola mr mustafa would you like to give some concluding remarks uh thank you thank you mohammed uh I'm going to be very short because I'm uh, mindful of the time for our friends from the East. So uh, I, uh, let me say thank you again uh, to the panelists. Uh, I think we had the chance to, uh, to listen to a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, some of them are case studies. Uh, I am thinking of uh, Freetown, Mexico and the experience of Turkey. Uh, I think the approach is comprehensive as, as uh, planned by Freetown. It's institutional coordination, the importance of human capital, financing and the infrastructure and the corridor approach that is uh, about to be used in Freetown. I can see the similarity with Mexico with a BRT uh, structured approach uh, and the regulation and, and the technology. Um, I think uh, the approaches are, are similar and I uh, encourage Freetown to keep in touch with our friends in Turkey and Mexico uh, and see uh, whether there is any uh, opportunity for collaboration and the World Bank CCTV will support that. And then we move to a more, uh, let's say, 30,000 feet approach to, uh, to reforms. Uh, uh, through the experience of uh, as MMR, I remind us about the importance of financial sustainability. But again, uh, quickly, uh, our friend from Benjamin de la Pena remind us this is a global issue. It's not a local one, uh, rightly so. And, and uh, he posed a very, very interesting question to us. What are the criteria for success. I am really tempted to say it's sustainability in its wider form. It's not only financial, economic, but it's only environmental and social. Uh, as the external costs of the informal sector are enormous, uh, and whatever we can do to minimize these external costs and improve the internal costs will be the right way to go. All in all, I think I learned a lot, and I hope uh, the participants uh, learned as well. We will uh, definitely summarize, try to summarize this uh, event, uh, very uh, brief summary, and we'll share it with all, uh, all the participants. Thank you again for UATP, for all the participants. Uh, 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 thank you again for, for, uh, for this very interesting webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mustafa. I think I also need to relay the apologies of Mr. Benjamin because he had to leave the call as we went a little bit over time. I would like to take a moment myself to thank the UITP for organizing this, to thank uh, the SSATP for providing the support that enables this webinar, and to thank all of you, dear panelists, for sharing your time, your knowledge, and your experience with us today. I'll give the floor finally to Mr. Arthur from the UITP to talk about the next webinar. And thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Mohamed. Uh, just um, real quick, because I know we're quite late. Uh, the next webinar will take place on Monday, 19 October uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, Brussels time and will be on innovations and new solutions for uh, small and individual uh, bus operators, how to adapt to the new normal. So basically, we'll be um, to present some innovative solutions, quick win and uh, quick solutions to implement to support the informal tra transport uh, uh, sector. 
And uh, finally, for the next steps, we'll be we'll be sending the the recording and the presentations to all the participants in the coming uh, week, and we'll also share with you a bit later a small summary of the of the whole webinar uh, of today. So thank you all for participating, and uh, have a good day, evening, wherever you are. Bye bye. Goodbye.